Hey everybody, it's Colin McCune from the New Fly Fisher. Thanks for joining us. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about one of my favorite places in Ontario, Algoma country. And what we're gonna be talking about is smallmouth bass fishing. Uh, I'm a huge bass fan, uh, especially smallmouth. And catching them on flies, I mean, I grew up catching them on lures as a, a young boy. And to catch them on flies now is so fantastic. Uh, let me show you some pictures about this area. I call it Trophy Alley. Like, this is, like, look at that bass. Or how about this one? Or how about this one? My biggest bass I've ever caught was in the place we're going to talk about. And what's really incredible, this is a drive-to location. Is these lakes and rivers where you can catch these big bass just off the Trans-Canada uh, Highway. We're talking about between Sault Ste. Marie and Spanish River, and then a little bit past Sault Ste. Marie, but this whole region, I call it Trophy Alley for a reason. There's big bass, they're accessible, you can stay at local resorts, and in fact, we're gonna be talking about a show that's coming up this weekend that we shot at Snowshoe Resort, which is about an hour outside of uh, Sault Ste. Marie, and not far from the border, that has access to all this fishing. We're also gonna be with professional guide, uh, Adam Valley from Angling Algoma, who took Mark and Mikey Metcalf out to enjoy some of this fishing. It's gonna be a great show. We're gonna have lots of Q and A, stay with us. And here's a little bit of what's coming up tonight. And Adam had me thrown into the back, slowly stripping, and then dropping it off the ledge. We saw the fish roll up in behind it. We slowed down the presentation and smash. It's spring. We're in Algoma, and that means one thing. We are looking for big pre-spawn bass. If we have any time left, we may explore some of the creeks and see what they have to offer. I'm Mikey Metcalf, coming up on the new fly fisher. Beautiful fish. And we found these beautiful brook trout. They're absolutely gorgeous fish. <laughs> you could certainly tell by Mikey's enthusiasm with that brook trout, he was having a really good trip. He got a huge bass, which we're going to show you uh, in the video tonight. And he also got some nice brook trout, all at drive to walk-in small streams that are in this region. There's some great fishing. And, you know, I'm really uh, blessed to know somebody that knows a lot about this region. And that's Adam Valley. And I'm going to bring him in here. Adam, how you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on tonight, Colin. And thank you for uh, getting a haircut and shaving. Um, <laughs> COVID, man. <laughs> I know, I know, COVID, I know. I had to get my haircut. When it, I put a ball cap on, it sticks out like, you know, corn stalks. I don't know. And then it's gray, so at least it looks good on you. <laughs> so, everyone, uh, I've known Adam for a number of years. Um, heard about him from the people in tourism. He He's, the, he's one of the guides in the region. Uh, that everyone in, in tourism says, oh, we got a group coming in or they get calls, I need help. On Adam's one of the people. And more importantly, when it comes to bass, Adam's like the man. Like this, <laughs> he knows about brook trout, he knows about steelhead, but when it comes to bass, you got it dialed in, right, Adam? That's definitely what I would consider more of uh, my specialty uh, than especially if you're relating steelhead and uh, brook trout. Well, you know where those other species are and you can help people, but um, I've introduced a number of friends of mine from the United States uh, to you. And uh, I feel really blessed that we had an opportunity to fish together on so many occasions over the last few years. And in fact, you've uh, actually taken my daughter out a number of times. So 
I've got good news, uh, Adam, before we go on. Mikey Metcalf, who's actually the host of the show that's coming up this weekend, uh, has been able to figure out his technology. <laughs> Metcalf with a five-time vice right in front of him. How are you doing? Cool as a cucumber on the outside. <laughs> are you coming well, to us? We're, we're, dealing with, <laughs> we're dealing with some uh, email issues and all that fun stuff, but here awesome. we are. And I don't even recognize mean, this guy. Who is this guy in the middle here? You mean technology? There's definitely not Adam. There's definitely not Adam. I can't get myself centered here. There you go. There it is, I think. And that's just one beer, Adam. Oh, I know. Yeah. How long is this? Where's thing? your son, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> Adam's yeah. dad, where's your son at? Yeah. Um, so, I, I, gents, I, unfortunately, I didn't have the pleasure of being with you. And Mark just moved, and he's still getting his uh, Wi-Fi set up, so he couldn't host this. So he asked me to do it. But yeah. you know, I think it's okay because I've been to this, going to this region for ten years now, and I absolutely love it. I go and I try to go every spring. I try to go every fall. And when I say fall, I'm talking about September because the fishing's so good. Usually, I'm too busy in the summer going to other par parts of Canada or the United States shooting the show. So I actually, and this, for people who wonder, you know, what is a host of the new fly fish? Where, where do they go when they want to go with their friends fishing? This is the place. <laughs> I, oh, yeah. Adam, yep. you join me sitting on a porch on, at one of the cottages or at one of the resorts that we, we rent with my friends and having a beer. And I love that place. After, after many guide trips, I happen to run into you guys. And yeah. This, not yeah. There to That's 100% uh, true. Yeah. And when I was when I was driving home from there, I was so mad at myself that it took me so long to get back up there. Because when you're when you're a young kid, that's one of the first regions on your list. That's that's like as soon as you get a car, that's we're going there. That's one of those places. If you grew up in a city, why? Because the whole region order, Mikey. As soon as soon as you get that car, that becomes a real viable place to get to. Yeah. But then what what happens when you get older? So you're up there when you're younger, and then and then you move on to Tomogamy, and then you move on to Halliburton, and you move on. Next thing you know, you're 50 years old, getting asked to go back up to Algoma. And I had to sit there and think. I was like, I haven't been up there in almost 30 years. I couldn't believe it. It's been that long. I was kicking myself the whole drive home. I had so much fun up there. Yeah, we had a good time for sure. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, uh, I watched the show. And it was absolutely fa fabulous. I mean, uh, the cameraman, Ryan, really knocked it out of the park, of course. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. What I was really happy about was that, you know, Mikey, you got an opportunity to see. And I remember when Mark went up there the first time. And I used to tell him, oh, yeah, we're getting two, three, four, five, six pounds smallmouth. And he's like, yeah, yeah, six pounds smallmouth, whatever. Yeah. He didn't believe me. And then he said, and then I started showing him pictures. And then the first time he went was with Bill. And, like, he called me from this is holy crap, these bass are really big, and they're yeah. everywhere. Oh, yeah. I'm like, I know, nobody <laughs> fishes for them up there. I mean, there's, there, there are some people in the, in the region that fish for them, but it's a very small percentage. Most of people, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, Adam, but it seems most of the people are focused on walleye, yeah, lake trout, you know, yeah. uh, other species, but not bass. <laughs> I would say that bass is kind of starting to grow, especially with a lot of the younger uh, the younger kids right now, you're starting to see a little bit of a swing. Mm -hmm. uh, but definitely up here, walleye, I would say, is king. Oh, yeah, definitely. But, yeah. but you know what's interesting is, um, you know, Adam, you're, you're going to be totally used to this. But when you're a guide, there's two species that people over-exaggerate the size of them. Steelhead. Oh, oh I got a nice 10-pounder. It's right off the bat, it's a 10-pounder. It's, it's Labrador. All we got was one five-pounder. No, you didn't. You got a three pound fish. Yep. When it's, you hook a five pound bass, it's so you funny. Know. Sorry, sorry, but it's so funny you're saying this, Mikey, because I was thinking this when Colin was talking about his first interactions with Mark about Algoma, saying how many six pounders he caught. <laughs> and Mark not believing it because so many people say, Oh, I caught a 10 pound smallmouth. Yeah. yeah it, you hear no. it all the time. You hear it all the time. And it's like, That's a three pounder. Like, it's a big <laughs> fish. It's a nice fish. Don't get me wrong. Three, four yeah. pound yeah. fish. 19 inch fish, very nice fish, but it's not an Algoma five, six pounder, seven. Yeah. You know, down in southern Ontario, three and a half pound fish, that's a respectable bass down here. That's, you take them all day long. Anywhere, um, really. 
They have an extra gear up there. I'm telling you, they 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 just got that turbo gear. That they just hit that that little extra gear. Um, but man, oh man, do they fight! Well, I'm gonna show a video here in a second, gents, from your trip that gives a little bit of uh, context to where we are and and things like that. But just to go with this, because um, when I first started going up there, and I'm gonna show a picture here. I showed it before. But the thing mm-hmm. about the bass there it, that people have to understand is that this is a place where you're going to catch a 19 and a half inch bass and it's going to have an 18 inch girth. Like Mm -hmm. this, they're, they're so fat. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about this tonight about what they're eating, why they're so big, you know, and, and what, why is it this region? It's kind of like coaster brook trout in the Nipigon river shed. Why are these bass so big in this area? We'll talk about that, but first let me go to a video here. Uh, that I know everybody loves video. I sure do. And it's basically the start. So let's have a look at this, guys. Welcome to Algoma, the ultimate do-it-yourself destination. This vast area spans all the way from Elliott Lake to the Sioux and all the way north of Horn Payne. This stunning region is renowned as an outdoor paradise with countless untouched rivers and lakes that would take a lifetime to explore. Algoma offers multi-species trophy fishing opportunities of a lifetime. Nestled in on beautiful Lake Wakamata lies Snowshoe Camp Resort. The owners Brent and Laura Shergold will instantly make you feel at home with their northern charm and the lodge is as cozy and clean as it gets, with breathtaking views and gorgeous sunsets as the backdrop. We're excited to be here, and for this adventure, we are lucky to have an old friend, Adam Valley, guiding us. What makes Adam so respected is his local knowledge. He knows where and when to find fish and how to adapt. He's fun to be around and a staple in the Algoma scene. The plan of attack was to race across the lake and jump from back bay to bay and constantly continuing to tempt the water. As the temps reached the high 50s, the biggest bass began to cruise into the shallows preparing for the upcoming spawn. All right. Good fish, man. So we moved spots. Um, Water was cold, we weren't seeing any fish moving at all. Uh, So we moved spots into this back bay. There's a creek mouth here. I switched to a game changer and um, this smallie just crushed it. The water's about five degrees warmer in here. Um, Adam and I were just talking about maybe, was it because of this creek um, coming in? But it's just, that's it, right? It's all about temperature at this time of year. See what he just barfed up? Oh, all those little glass minnows. Look at this. Wow, look at them all. All right, man. That's a good start, anyway. Good way to start the day. Nice small one. All right, so I got everyone back here. Oh, I got my uh-huh. bass behind me as a backdrop. Perfect. So, um, gents, uh, you know, probably the best thing. Adam, why don't you tell us a little bit about the region? Because, like, how far north are the smallmouth? Like, you've got them on Lake Huron. Yeah. But how far north can you expect to find them in that region? Honestly, I'm still exploring how far north they're going. And uh, I'm learning that they go much further north even towards Shaplo, um, than I ever knew. So that's, you're looking at a two and a half hour trip from Sault Ste. Marie, roughly an hour, hour and a half from our stay at Wakamata. So they go probably as far north as you want to go. 
um, to chase them, honestly. Wow. There's, there is going to be the walleye line, of course, Colin. You know, you know what I mean, where you get into everything just turns into walleye and northern pike and those type of lakes, and then you get into your brook trout. And it seems like it seems like there's almost a line with it. And I would say Shaplow, if I had to guess. How about that? I would say that's a good line because just north of Massey, um, I went to a place called Ritchie Falls. Yeah. And we went there actually to catch lake trout and brook trout. And it's 50 miles by gravel road mm -hmm. to the lake there. And the lake has got smallmouth bass in it. Nobody fishes for them. Mm -hmm. And I kept catching smallmouth when I was lake trout fishing. And this was at the end of May. But, you know, I guess the key is you can fish them in Lake Huron. Um, I went out one time with you uh, this mm -hmm. past year with my daughter. And we were out there, and unfortunately, we didn't have much luck. The, the fish weren't cooperating, but yeah. we were seeing tons of them on the sonar. Mm -hmm. But you, And that's some of the bigger fish in the area. But you also have a lot of inland lakes and then some of the rivers that have very big bass, right? Yeah, and the one thing you got to know when you're coming up here to chase these fish is they all have different zones. Um, from If you're going to Lake Huron, Lake Superior, or inland, you're, you're fishing all different zones whether it's zone 14, zone 10, or I believe Superior is zone 9. So just make sure that you're, there's a lot of imaginary lines up here, and you have yeah. to make sure that, that the regulations do change once you cross them. So, um, And the reason I'm saying that is because only our lakes in zone 10 are the ones that are actually open all year round. Lake Superior is as well, but only our inland lakes. Huron is completely cut off, just like um, Southern Ontario uh, third or fourth Saturday in June. Right. So that actually brings up a good point. Uh, zone 10, what people should know, and it's how I first started going there because, uh, Mikey, you can talk about this as well, because, mm -hmm. um, I remember when I first went up there and I told friends I was going up there and they were like, Oh no, no Colin, you're fishing illegally. That, that that's closed up there. And I go, no, no, they changed the rules. <laughs> so first 10, thing I that which is this very big area. And I like to use uh, Thessalon, which is uh, along the Trans-Canada Highway. That's kind of like the center of access for this huge area that's there and all those lakes. And there's like tons of lakes. And this is, you know, Adam, you take people with your boat uh, out to all these different places based on the conditions, time of the year. But basically, you know, I was going up there in May. Uh, some guys go in early June and you're either doing the pre-spawn uh, I like to do the post spawn and then into the summer and then in the heat of the summer you know not necessarily the best for fly fishers uh, more with the spin fishing community uh, would be my opinion on what yours is Adam and then we go into September when it's starting to change and it's bang on again it's you know you have I find that some of the best action is in, in September because I got the feedback on but Adam what's what's your opinion on that with regards to uh mm -hmm the fishing and the kind of the tempo of it. I, I pretty much agree with everything you're saying, except for you can catch them in the summer on the fly. You're going to be just really, um, you're going to be really contradicted by your, your conditions. The bites are going to burn off a lot early, a lot sooner in the, in the, uh, the, the dog days of summer type thing. Like these fish are going to push shallow on your sunny days and stuff like that. And you might catch them cruising on those sunny days. But that type of bite is going to burn off as the sun gets up really high. You'll, but you will have that bite and you'll have that good top water bite in that morning bite where you can actually chase those smallmouth from, you know, 6 to 10 o'clock in the morning. And then those fish are going to start kind of pulling off out deeper, whether they suspend off or whatever it is they do. Um, and then they kind of will get a little bit tougher to catch and kind of pull out deeper, whatever. So well, Mike, what, what you, I really want to add something to that? Uh, yeah, what I really enjoyed about it is, um, you know, when you're an angler down in southern Ontario, and especially when you're doing what we do, we don't really get a chance to get onto the bass until, you know, dead of the summer. Mm -hmm. So to get up there at that time of the year, it's a completely unique, unique experience that I've never done it before. So I jumped on it. It's uh -oh. just uh, I don't associate bass with that season. So the first thing I wanted to do was just go for the experience. Um, yeah. Just to say, I went up there and checked it out, and uh, it did not disappoint. That that and, and, and it also gives you another little um, 
another little option too at that time of year because you're kind of right in the, the middle of everything just ready to kick off so it's just another option you have yeah i, I agree mikey and that pre-spawn bite before they really get up on the bed is uh yeah. that that's probably probably my favorite time of year i would say yeah. is that pre-spawn bite between that and the fall is kind of i don't know yeah, you know what i was uh what I would like to do one time is go up there and try to get out and fish them on the flats. Yeah. And just chase just them. It's like around. we're in Bahamas. Just get in the flats and try to get these things coming in. Yeah. We coming into the shallows. I think that would be really, really neat to do one time. I actually have uh, some bites like that on here on where I'll chase them. I mean, Superior can be like that too. You just kind of put your trolling motor on 10 and you're looking as far as you can and trying to spot out fish and you basically chase them down. And now they got mm -hmm. all the electronics changes with like sword forward facing sonar that's just really revolutionary revolutionizing things where you can see these fish from so far out and actually get right on them and chase a fish to the point where you're casting at a target yeah wow okay. yeah i just uh, I, uh, sorry colin no go ahead no, I, I uh another thing about that time of year is is um you realize just how close it is to chasing down trout because we're constantly temping waters day and night. We're temping, 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 temping. But I'm not used to people doing that in the bass world because I associate bass with the summertime. So I found it fascinating to watch Adam in action doing what I do, but with a different species of fish. So I was learning a whole new thing when I was there. I was literally learning all about how these fish behave. And I found that as fun as the fishing. It's, it's, it's really unique. I, I really, really enjoyed it. It is. I, I want to do, I do want to say one thing as much as the bass spawn does relate to the temperature in the spring does really revolve around temps warming. They aren't absolutely everything. Um, those bass are going to pull up and they're going to know that that spawn is getting close just specifically from length of the days that we are having from the amount of moons we've had, there are certain triggers in the environment that really get these fish pushed up. And I've, I've through experience more and more guiding now, I've seen fish on bed, on bed from 57 degrees all the way up to 68 degrees. And I've seen the male and the female on the bed. So. Hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. It is. It's, it's a, they're pretty uh, fascinating um, to chase, especially when you get around the spawn and stuff like that. They are, they're really, uh, really cool, and you, you're always learning. If if you ever think you learned everything in fishing, you, you you'll never figure it all out, and you might as well quit. That's true. So true. Very true. So, gents, I'm going to play a video, and it's talking about size, because uh, you know we've been spouting off some numbers about size of the smallmouth. Um, but let's watch this video from the show, and it'll give people a little bit of perspective. And we'll come back and talk about it. So, here we go. So what we did is we, we switched up. We were just saying we, we, uh, we have Mark running on the surface and I'm following him subsurface. We're looking for cruising fish. So the temps have uh, warmed up and we're starting to get a little more aggressive with our, uh, with our stripping. They're like a wolf pack. If there's Big one, time. there's often a bunch of them with it or another one with it. Yeah. And Partner fishing is key because I can throw this popper out behind and if there's anybody running with this little guy, with this big guy, it's awesome. There you go. The fat fish. Oh, that's a good one. So that's our average Algoma small. Oh, wow. Welcome. Nice job. Cheers. Worth the drive. Can't beat this. So, let me get this off here, boys. 
So um, you're talking about your average fish. And this is where I had a lot of my friends when I first started coming up there. And then, of course, they came up to try it. And <laughs> once they came, they were addicted. And that's – you've met my friend Adam uh, Terry. And yep. we've got Ricky from Florida. And we got all these different – Eric and Brett and uh, Norm and all my friends have come up there. And, and it's interesting is because – and you said this, Mikey. A lot of them, that time period – they're looking for a brook trout. And just to be clear, I mean, we're going to talk about the brook trout in the area here a little later in the show, but all streams around, they got brook trout on them. But generally speaking, I don't want to catch brook trout. I don't want to catch these bass. Where do you get bass <laughs> like this on a five or six weight ride? I mean, it's insane. So, Adam, yeah. you know, people ask me, what's an average size there? And I tell them the range for me that I've caught. I mean, you'll get small ones, but is that two and a half to four pound range? Kind of. Yeah. Would yep. that be a fair assessment? Yep. I would, I would, I would. Say, I, don't, I don't think we saw one smaller than two and a half pounds. No, most of them are even three to three to four pounds. I mean, you of course you do catch smaller fish, but yeah. No, oh, I think we lost somebody. Oh, he got. Uh, there you go. I got him back. Like the guy from back Spinal down. Tap. You know the drummer from Spinal Tap who just blows up. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> All right, yeah. So. Um, that's quick to that let's let's talk about why the bass are so big in this area because that's the next question because people say well is it genetics is it this is it that you know and, and the, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the uh the nipigon brook trout or coaster brook trout which are all the way from michigan all the way up to nipigon river and and that part of uh, uh lake superior there's genetics definitely, but they're also rooted in food sources, right? Yeah. You, in order to get big, it doesn't matter if it's a brook trout in Labrador or it's a brown trout in the North Platte River, the food's got to be there to help them get big and then time and evolve the genetics to make them big, right? So the thing that, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, from what I understand and talking to a number of uh, biologists and stuff like that, the big influencer in this region is the smelt. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, the smelt or the, uh, like the Cisco. The Cisco, I think, plays more of a role too than uh, we know because I see them eating um, and spitting up, coughing up a lot of like 12 to 14 inch Cisco or lake herring. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a big part of their diet, especially on our Lake Huron system, I know the St. Mary's River is actually one of the biggest breeding grounds for the uh, Cisco, so I, I'm pretty sure it's pretty prevalent up here as well. Well, speaking of that, I want to show everyone, okay, if you want an idea, this is my fly box, one of my fly boxes with smell <laughs> patterns in it. Yep. This is my small one, and then yeah. there's my other smelt box which you can see here there it is getting it right and uh, somebody i saw in the comments was asking about fly patterns and uh yeah definitely i do use game changers which are a good pattern which is right here uh works all the time but the only thing i don't like about it it's a bit heavy it's kind of like casting a wet sock um, <laughs> But, you know, what, what would it be equivalent? It's like a sluggo or a caffeine shad or... Yeah, some sort of soft jerk bait or jerk bait. When it gets a little bit wetter, it has a little bit more of a sink to it. Um, you can really... We, we actually found this when we did this show. You can really make that bait move quite well with a loop knot. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, Jim Weatherwax uh, from Colorado is asking us about pre-spawn flies which is what we're talking about here um this has been my rule of thumb there uh first of all i want to show you my number one fly for up there and uh tim flagler the famous fly tire mm -hmm. at my my beckoning finally tied it and uh scotty's uh, mcfly, Scotty McFly. Uh, real deadly deadly but what i like about it is a simple pattern uh because there are pike up there and mm -hmm. i lose seas. <laughs> <laughs> between that and timber on the bottom i lose a lot of these but game changers any of these smelt patterns not perfect uh, like even some of them i'm going to pull one up here 
I like to make fur craft flies again because they're not heavy to cast. And this one's got the tan on the back. And that's one thing, uh, Adam, I noticed when I've been in like Little Basswood or uh, some of the other lakes in, in that region around Thessalon, when we've caught them and they've coughed them up, a lot of times, you know, obviously they're being digested, but they seem to either have this tan to medium green back. Would that be what you've seen too? Yeah, like an olive almost, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we we saw cool quite, a, well. quite a lot of bass coughing up uh, shiners. Yeah, yeah. And this is another one, a smaller one. This is a CK bait fish, and this has got that kind of like leatherette um, tail. But it's, it's again, it's a silhouette. The way the, the fly works, I like flies that are very light. And mm -hmm. you're allowed to use two flies. You can do a two-fly rig. Sometimes that works. But the thing I was going to go back to is that I found that, uh, um, and you can tell me about your experience, but it's been my experience that when you get those cold days, when the water temperature drops again, puts the fish down and they've gone a little bit deeper, then they're a little slower, right? Because the water, when you go down to eight feet, I mean, it's pretty darn cold, right, Adam? Yeah, I mean, their, their metabolism is going to go a lot off of the temperature. Mm -hmm. so that's what is going to drive those fish in and out per se. But those fish, if we're talking pre-spawn right now, those fish are always going to be at least somewhere close to that spawning pocket. Right. I, I actually have a, a question Go ahead. in regards, uh, sorry, Colin, in regards to uh, the cold water up there, how old would a six pound smallmouth bass be in that region? How old would you figure that fish? I'm not a biologist, but I would have in that cold up. I would say twenty-five to plus. Wow. twenty-five plus. That would be my guess. Well, that's a very good question, Mikey. That uh, Jack Imhoff from uh, TU and who who worked for Ministry of Natural Resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was part of a study many years ago in the Grand River, and he told me, and this is a lot farther south in Ontario, which has a longer growing season. On the Grand River, when you caught a four to five pound bass, a, he said a four pound bass who's generally 17 to 18 years old. In so southern Ontario. A six pound bass, when you say it's 20, wow. 25 years, I absolutely yeah. believe. You know what? It's, Very it's, old fish. It sounds right about right there. And we're, if we're going to go back, if we can go back to what you were talking about earlier, uh, Colin, we were talking about uh, some of the components of why our bass getting so big and with the smelt. I believe that kind of one of the things with the area with why the bass have gotten so big is because of lack of pressure. It's allowed them years and years and years to compile really good genetics. Plus they have the bait fish to get that big. Yep. Plus big bodies of water. Plus, yeah, we have big bodies of water. They, we have all the, you know, the glacial type lakes that have um, like a Highland Reservoir type lake that have a deep basin, maybe a shallow flat with steep breaks and, I just think it's all the right ingredients really up here and the lack of fishing over the years plus the abundance of lakes really adds to that the reason why the fish are so big here i think that it has to do with why the genetics have gotten so good mm. okay so let's just uh uh and aaron i'll get to your question in just a second but i want to just stick with the food source for a second and that is just it's been my experience that uh, going back to when the, the water, like when I found when, if I'm there in the spring, if I'm there in May, early June, and we have cold air come in, which is very common then, yep. rainy days, then they weren't willing to chase uh, smelt patterns or any of the bait fish patterns as much. And that's when I flipped over and I started using some of my crayfish patterns. And I think you've seen Rick do that, who you've guided a lot with. Um with an intermediate line near the bottom, little, you know, slow little tugs. And I use like a bronze goddess. Some of the other fly patterns are very popular to, to get them to strike. Um, yeah. And again, they're still feeding, but they're just, they're not in chase mode as opposed to if the water temperature was at 60 degrees or 61. Right. I guess the best way to put it would be the strike zone is uh, gets smaller as the water temperature drops. That would be the best way to look at it. As the yep. water temperature begins to grow, that their metabolism begins to so rise, fish will start chasing. 
And they're also going to come up on those flats that they're dropping off of into that eight, 10 foot of water. Like you're talking about Colin. And that's, that's when they get on those more of a bottom feeding, uh, style fly, like your crayfish or something where you got to get it, uh, closer to the, to the bottom or subsurface or sub, sorry. Uh, Oh, what would I, what's the, uh, thermal in, intermediate, sorry. The aim of your fly line. Yeah. yeah. So thanks for that. Uh, and then the other thing I want to show is cause in this, when you guys were there, when the yeah. conditions are right, sun's out again, this is, we're talking May, early June, then mm -hmm. the popper's on. And that can be some pretty spectacular pop, you know, the popper fishing's insane at times. And especially in the summer, Adam, uh, that's what's great. And Aaron was asking, he said, you know, what's the best time in the summer? Uh, is it between six and 10 AM in the morning? Is it, have you fished at, at 2 AM to 6 AM? I know personally, I went out once at night on a full moon and we killed <laughs> on yep. pop. I've done the same. I've yeah. done the same on an original floating Rapala, same thing, just jerking it on top, like a top water. Um, it, if you talk to people down in Southern United States, and I know this for a fact when I go to lakes like Lake uh, Gunnersville Lake and stuff like that, as the water gets really warm, those fish actually tend to feed more at night. So in the summertime, I would say throwing uh, a topwater in the evening, you're definitely going to be able to generate bites. And I definitely think that with that full moon, like you're talking about, Colin, those would probably be your nights that you'd want to target it more because I believe that that full moon does have an effect on uh, how actively fish are going to feed. Well, interesting you say this, Adam, because uh, I keep using that word interesting tonight. But uh, uh, Frank, uh, who you've met, who's uh, from uh, Michigan, has done, who comes up there every summer, he did a lot of research on this, and he was saying to me that the zooplankton, when it comes up in the lake on a full moon, yeah, uh, which is a natural occurring thing, comes up and it brings the smelt and bait fish up chasing it, eating it. But when they have the moon, the small wolf can see them against the surface. So that's why he said that's so why what he some of his best bites on those nights with hula poppers and rebels and, you know, stuff like that. And Mikey, I'm sure you threw them in your day. I did when I was younger, you know, and they work well normally, but at like one o'clock in the morning <laughs> and I couldn't see much. I mean, I could see, you know, things, but all you hear is the big splash and then you feel your blind. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, it's a young man's game. The, the, uh, the 2 a.m. stuff right yep. there. That's a, you got to have young eyes to be doing that. Well, that'd be Adam and me. I don't know about you, Mikey. So anyways, <laughs> <That's definitely nothing. laughs> and a good, okay. I'm going to put on some, uh, fishing here. And this next video is Adam doing an assessment of how the day should go based on conditions. It's uh, pretty interesting to see how Adam really dials it in for the guys and helps them get set up for their day based on the conditions. Okay. By the end of the day yesterday, we started to chase warm water. As the sun came up, the fish started to push up shallow getting on their final pre-spawn bite before they start to get up and make their beds. We focused on sand and grass flats, but since the weather is still getting a little bit cool at night and the body of water that we were fishing is very big, today we've decided to change gears and find a smaller body of water up here in Algoma, which is very close to where we're at and very accessible. And we're gonna try and find a little bit of warmer water and find fish that are still up shallow and ready to almost spawn. We are gonna be looking for those fish that are really making their last push before the full moon to really put the feed bag on so that they can have a successful and a hearty spawn. First thing in the morning, we're gonna focus a little bit more off the brakes, much like yesterday. But with the size of the lake we're gonna be fishing today, we know that with the warming weather pattern that we've been having, the water is gonna be a little bit warmer and the switch is gonna go off a lot sooner. These fish are gonna to push to the shallows a lot sooner than later on in the afternoon that we had to deal with yesterday because of the bigger lake and the cooler water. These fish are gonna push up earlier through the day, which means that we are gonna transition from fishing transitions off of points 
and we are going to start making our way back to spawning pockets and fishing the flats with where there's sand and grass mix. So to start the day, while we're fishing off the transitions and out in the deeper water, we're going to have the guys throwing a game changer and a black woolly bugger. We're going to have them working it off the break and looking for those suspended fish to come up. As the day progresses and the water warms, we're going to try and look and get them on a popper bite. So we're going to look for top water as the water starts to exceed the 60 degree mark and hope that we can get some fish to take on top as well. Nice. Nice. Oh. oh. <sighs> Lost a good one. It was a really good one. Had a hook in her and everything. There you go, Mark. Good job. That a boy. Oh, that's a big fish. What a way to start the day here at Snowshoe. That is a good smallmouth. We decided to switch things up and and uh, try to cover as much of the water column as we could. So Mikey's throwing a popper and uh, I threw out a streamer <clears throat> and we saw this fish cruising and uh, sure enough, she came right over and ate it. And it's a great one. It is a great start. We call this trophy alley <laughs> Adam, for a reason, because you can come to this region of Algoma and dance with absolute giant smallmouth bass. I mean, catching fish in the six, seven, eight pound class isn't uncommon. This one's not that big, but you have a legitimate shot at it for sure. This one's probably gonna be three and three quarter. Strong though. Oh my gosh. Now that water's warming up. On a five weight? So it pays. Oh, beautiful. It pays to pay attention to the temperature, to the environmental cues that are given to you. We found warm water here through guides that are dialed in and connected. Warm water means hungry fish. How do you like that? <laughs> what a great fish. There's the fly she ate. A little bit of flash, bead head. Nice woolly bugger fish. And I just can't help but smile. It's just me, I guess. But that just, I wouldn't even there. You guys were the ones who joined, especially you, Mikey. Uh, obviously, Mark. I don't smile for this, but wow. Ear to ear. Looking back at those memories, it was so much fun. Yeah, we had a good time. So, you know, watching you talk like that, it's almost like you went to school for that. Well, <laughs> I spent a lot of time watching seminars and taking notes myself. <laughs> If you want to bring out the inner fishing nerd here, uh, talking about myself, yeah. Yeah. It's really so, impressive. We've got a great question. Uh, somebody's asking whether or not do you use barometric pressure, Adam, when you're taking uh, people out for bass fishing? So barometric pressure is definitely something that I think affects the fish. It's not something that I've completely dialed in that I would say uh, I'll – I'm not really versed enough to really – give a comment too much on that like i don't feel like i could give really good advice on it because i'm still figuring it out myself but i believe that every day there's a certain point of the day where those bigger fish um are gonna eat and i think that it has a lot to do with the biggest drop in the day in that barometric pressure and I'll, the reason why i think this is because when i'm watching these tournaments and you're watching it on a live stream now we're able to see how a lot of lakes and stuff like that, people will catch big fish all within a half an hour time frame. 
So to me, that's telling me that like the whole lake is kind of going off as guys are fishing different areas of it. And it's like all those big fish are kind of caught within a half hour time period. So mm. it's just kind of to me. And then there's, there's something to it. Um, like I said, there's, those are little things that I'm kind of really trying to dial in. And I, as I musky fish a lot more, that's, I believe that they are really highly affected by a barometric pressure. So that's something that um, I'm trying to learn and master, I, I guess. Yep. The one thing uh, I will say, and I know what your opinion is, Mikey, but it, it's been my experience right now that uh, barometric pressure doesn't seem to impact river fish or river bass as dramatically as it does on lakes. Hmm. Uh, and I think that's, there's a number of factors. And, and obviously if we're talking a big river that's got slow moving water, that's a different ball game. They're like slow moving yep. lakes, but I'm talking uh, about definitely. a grand river or Saugeen river where the water's moving at a fair clip. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's going to impact them, but they seem to recover quicker than fish in a lake when you, and, and this is, Again, the other part of the equation is I'm going to say in the spring, I find the swings of the barometric pressure will impact the fish, but they seem to recover quicker as opposed to the summer. And in the fall, I find as especially the later it gets, the same thing applies, that the barometric pressure swings don't affect the bass as much in the end of September as they do at the start of September. What, Adam, what's your opinion on that? In fact, in uh, those those cold fronts or pressure changes will actually trigger bites or trigger a bite in the full time. I find it's almost like the fish feel that first cold snap and it's like a trigger to them. You know, they got to get on the feed bag and get ready to start feeding up for the winter because once the water gets so cold, those bass go basically dormant and they feed very little over the winter time and they suspend over uh, deep mud flats and things like that or shoals, things where they have uh, an easy transition line. And they just, um, they know they're not going to eat. So they know they have to put that feed bag on. And that's what that, why, what, where the difference comes from spring to fall. Okay. So, um, gents, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the next video. But before I do, I just want to, for anybody that's joined us uh, or that watches this later, I just want to reiterate that what we're talking about is an area um, where, the fishing is really, really, I mean, I've had people from Virginia up here. I've had people from uh, different parts of the USA, and they come up here for one reason. The number of fish and the size of fish, the lack of pressure, and, and, and to give you a perspective, everyone, this is these are places just off the Trans-Canada Highway. I would mm -hmm. strongly recommend that you do hire Adam uh, just to help get you focused and give you a sense of geography and dial you into what lakes and rivers are working at whenever you come, whether it's spring, summer, or fall. But we're talking very affordable, very accessible fishing. This is what's fantastic about this region. Compared to some other places where you have to do a fly-in or things like that, uh, we're staying at cottages. We're staying snowshoe resort is a very affordable place. You get a whole cabin. I, I usually, there's three or four of us to a cabin, so we split it for a week. Very cheap, bring our own food. Fantastic. We'll go into the local towns like Thessalon or Iron Bridge, whatever, and get a meal. We're talking a great vacation, cheap drive to, fantastic. And the, the okay. last four hours of drive, you just... This. Mikey, go ahead while I'm setting this up. Go ahead. Sorry, the, the last uh, four hours of the drive, you're just staring at the most beautiful scenery. It doesn't feel like it took me, I think, nine hours. It felt like four or five hours. It is nice up here. You start, you know, you get to that certain level, you start looking for moose and you do this. Next thing you know, it's like, okay, we're almost here. Yeah. Paul, you can probably attest the uh, the north drive is actually even maybe a little bit nicer than uh, the one from that Mikey would have made up towards uh, Wawa. And yeah, yeah, because you guys going through the back. That's that's yeah. where your drive is very nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's very pretty. If I'm, I'm definitely going was back asking back. earlier about coming from the west, you know, west of, of Sault Ste. Marie from Michigan, that's an absolutely gorgeous drive. Like, it is. Oh, yeah. That would be gorgeous, that one. Yeah. Okay, boys, I'm going to put on a video, and we're going to talk about popper fishing.
There's little doubt that fishing poppers for smallmouth bass is arguably one of the most fantastic ways to take these fish. Um, but the fish are gonna tell you what they want. Um, so when you begin your day fishing with poppers, what I like to do is vary the cadence of my retrieve upon my cast. That'll tell you which way the fish want it. So I'll start out by casting out my popper and actually letting it sit for 30 seconds to a minute till all those rings dissipate. One tiny little movement and sometimes that giant smallmouth will come up and engulf it. Then I increase the cadence of my retrieve until I figure out the way they want it. Sometimes I'll even just rip them in. The fish will tell you what they want. All right, fish. Uh, so I moved down after Mike caught that fantastically big smallmouth. I moved down to 4X. This is a place where world records can happen. And we'll see what we can do. I've got a good one on here. It's not gonna be a world record, but should go three anyway. And what a sip. It was just so gentle and light. Can't even see the No, he just engulfed it. Put a heck of a cast on that fish, Mark. Thanks, Mike. These cruisers are fun. You can see them coming up and down these yeah. lines. And uh, it's sight casting. It's just great. It's interactive fishing. <laughs> Good job. Nice fish, man. That is a great, great fish. You can't beat smallmouth on a popper all day long. That is just awesome. So fun. All right, we'll get this guy back in the water. And away he goes. <laughs> uh, I gotta tell Is you. Anything more fun? No, honestly, I, I like. I guess the only thing I could say is is throwing mice patterns for big brook trout, catching brown trout on a dry fly, or catching big smallmouth on poppers. I mean, it's yeah, it's just sex for your arm, and there's no other way to put yeah. it. It's just fantastic. Right. It's right so much it. fun, it's so, so fun. visually exciting. <laughs> And I got to tell you about a moment I had once. Uh, I was on a, a lake. Um, Adam, you weren't with me. I was uh, with a couple of friends, and we had two different boats. One guy said, I'll go to this bay, and we'll go to this bay. And we went into the bay, went right in the center, and the wind was blowing in, dropped the anchor in the back end, and we, we were both standing up trying to look around, and then all of a sudden we saw them. And, and it was just what Mark was talking about. And you see this very specifically in the early part of the year, pre-spawn, you would see a, the wolf pack. The shadows, four, mm -hmm. five, six, smallmouth. You see goosebumps cruising around. Yeah, and then and it's like, oh, there they are. And then and it's just like bone fishing. You're like getting that cast out, putting that popper <laughs> in front, and then you see them chasing. Who's gonna get it first, right? Yeah. Yeah. So much fun. So you, you know, and you pop it, and you pop it, and then you can yeah. see it coming behind. Yeah. And you're like, is it this one? And then all of a sudden, you just. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes uh, I, get right I, get goose, too. I get goosebumps I, just talking about that. <laughs> I know, I know. And that these poppers, you know, like we could do a whole show about the flies, but these poppers that I've got here, um, if I had to pick a few colors that I would want to take there, and I don't know what your experience was, but I'm talking throughout the season, whether it's the spring, summer, or fall, uh, I think it's kind of due to the watercolors up there, but orange, yellow. They're my two top and then a dark color, like a dark green or a black for low light late evening. And in fact, sometimes uh, what we'll do, and this is more for the camera than it is anything else. I'll have a yellow popper on and because um, I can see it really well dark for casting, but I'll take uh, a black marker and color the bottom of that popper so that the bass can see it better against the, the falling light. Oh, it's a great so, idea. So much fun. Um, we had somebody asking, Jeff Thompson was asking, he says, I've been making my own model leaders with Maxima. And uh, do you have any suggestions on leaders? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give my suggestion. And then Mikey, I'd like to give, have what your opinion is. Maxima is great stuff. Uh, so is, uh, there's a lot of good product out there for leaders. You can make step down ones. And I'm, I'm going to be talking specifically about uh, with a floating line. When you're using um, 
a sinking line, it's a different ball game, but for a floating line, I like to use a straight piece of leader. Uh, like if I was using Maxima, I use eight or 10 pound uh, chameleon or their fluorocarbon, but just straight piece. You don't need to step it down. I'm casting poppers. I'm throwing uh, the Scotty McFlies or game changers. But I, it's been my experience that a, a leader of eight to 10 feet, just perfect for right through the whole season. If I'm using an intermediate line or a sink tip, then I'm going to shorten that down to four feet, maybe five at most. But a straight piece. You don't need to step down. This is my opinion. I'm not throwing – if I was throwing hex flies, obviously I'd be changing it up a bit to step it down to get the best use of the uh, the physics to get that fly out. But that's my opinion. Mikey, what's yours? I don't fish with a lot of uh, sinking line. I mostly fish with floating. Um, and – I'm I'm the, I'm the same as you. When we're throwing the little size 20 dries and things like that, I'd like to really taper it down so we could turn the, the fly over. With, you know, we get down to five or six X. But I think when you're bass fishing and you just want something, the butt section just thick enough that you could roll it. And then and then the, the I find the fly does the rest of the work for you. Those big, heavy streamers, they do all that for you. So once you stop that rod, the momentum of those big, heavy streamers, they just pull everything out and they roll it for you. So I think I think – Less is more. I think yeah. I think you got to just go right down to the basics. I'm like you. I don't like the really long leaders. I like between seven and seven and nine. Uh, when it's windy, I like to go a little shorter even because just things knuckle a bit in the wind. Yeah. But uh, when it comes to bass fishing, th that's one of the beautiful things about these fish. They are fly friendly. They are nasty. They are aggressive. They don't care if that was a cast that was delivered by – Lee Wolf himself, they see that popper hit that thing or that streamer, and that's all it takes. Sometimes, sometimes to be honest, um, some people that have horrible casts, they smack that fly down on the water. It actually attracts the bass. Yeah, it's true. So, so forget the style points. I think I think just I break it down, and 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 I find bass is also one of those species that. Um, you could come right out of the gate fly fishing for them. Uh, you're up at someone's cottage and you're just getting into fly fishing. It's very basic. Mono line very to good. a fly and get on the dock and start casting. And that's all it takes. And you're in the game. Okay. So um, to that, uh, Paul asked us what size popper, uh, which is a really good question because I found that I, I bring a variety of poppers uh, in different sizes. Um, I, I generally like to use I, I if i had to pick a size on the hook i i like to use a size six or eight as a general rule like the ones i was showing here they're not they're kind of a reasonable size but i also have some little ones because uh and, and adam you can speak to this on the conventional tackle side compared to the fly fishing side i mean sometimes these bass they want like i'll throw something big that a pike will eat and they're when they're on and they're aggressive and they're looking for something and it could be a little duckling. I mean, they're on, but there are times when it's just going to be that little sit and they, they want something small like you'd use for panfish. Uh, Adam, what's your opinion on this? I think we're going to go back to weather patterns again. And uh, I think that you're going to find a lot of the times when they're going onto that sip and you're downsizing your flies is probably your weather patterns that are, dictating why the fish are biting that way yeah. i also would say that uh i'm gonna I, if i have a client on the boat i'm gonna say we're first thing i'm looking at is obviously the size of the bait and then i'm gonna look at the clarity of the water so if the water's a little bit dirtier i'm gonna throw probably a bigger popper and that's something you're going to be able to get away with more and that's something that the fish is going to be able to find easier in dirtier water where you might not be able to get away with that in uh, a clean cleaner water setting yeah gents uh i just realized uh not only did i miss a good hockey game but it's 10 o'clock so we're going to keep going here <laughs> and if you don't mind staying with me so what i'm going to do right now for everyone that's watching this is i'm going to uh put another video up here and i think the next few videos they're going to blow your socks off I, and where's gonna, the final score i don't know but i don't think my team won so let's not watch and let's not talk about it that means my An awful team from Toronto, I think, won. Let's just check this here. Okay. 
Here's a little bit about the resort we're staying in. And I think it's important for everyone when you watch this to understand there's some really great very affordable, very accessible. The lake they're on. Social Camp is a six housekeeping cabins, four seasons, and we cater to families, fishermen, hunters, ATVists, snowmobiles, any outdoor enthusiasts. When people come to Snowshoe Camp, they can expect a relaxed atmosphere, a beautiful sand beach for the kids to play, a gorgeous secluded lake for fishing opportunities. There's tons of trails for ATVing, hiking, snowshoeing, snowmobiling, and just a nice relaxed family environment. We're a housekeeping resort. Uh, all the cabins have a full kitchen, full bathroom, barbecues, on the, on the deck overlooking the water, their own fire pit. We also have uh, a beautiful rec hall that you can see in my background with a screened in porch, a barbecue there in case you need to get out of the rain. Uh, and pool table, ping pong table, satellite TV for those uh, lazy days. Waccamata Lake has a beautiful smallmouth bass population, lake trout, whitefish, pike, and perch. So we are located on the shores of Waccamata Lake, but there are also nearby fishing opportunities for speckled trout, rainbow, uh, pickerel, and some of the other lakes and rivers in the area. For wildlife viewing opportunities in the area, there are deer, moose, bear, eagles on the lake. Uh, there's an elk population in the area. We also see wild turkey, uh, bobcats, um, I've been told of cougar sightings in the area even. This is our home and we encourage you to make it your home also. Sweet. So that's a little bit about where you guys stayed. Uh, you want to add anything about the accommodations there, Mikey? Well, first and foremost, they're super nice people. Um, the, the two owners there were really, really nice people. That's they're, Warren Brent, right? Yeah, they're they're the traditional yeah. northern. Come on in, glad you're here. What can we do to help? Just super friendly. They got make the northern touch up there. Yeah, they make you feel at home. It's you feel like you're at home up in those little spots. They really make you feel like you're part of their family. You met them for five days, and and you know they're just super homey. Really, really nice. Good stuff. I think like going back to what I said at the start, though. For anybody that's watching this, um, you know, because, you know, you obviously see us doing shows in Labrador and down in the Caribbean and stuff. And I get emails because, oh, that looks really wonderful, but I can't afford this or I can't afford yeah. that. And like we do shows in all different types of places. And to me, this it's one of the reasons why, as I said at the start, this is why I come here with my friends. This is a place where a bunch of buddies can come and have a great fishing trip, whoever the group is and very affordable and good fishing and there's so many lakes and rivers in the area which is why i'm going to go to the next thing is we're going to talk about those pesky brook trout that you have in the area because well here let's watch the video if you like decided to switch it up a little bit today as we've been exploring the area we've been finding these beautiful little trout creeks we decided let's get out of the sun today let's get in our waders and let's look for some brookies and some rainbows and explore this gorgeous area. If you look around, we're the only people up here. We have the whole river to ourselves, and you can explore for as long as you want up here. It's absolutely beautiful. So what we're doing now is we're just gonna pick apart this little creek foot by foot, finding the seams and we're running nymphs through there. And the way to fish these little creeks is to stick and move. We want to fish it, go through a run thoroughly. If you feel satisfied, you've worked it hard, move on down the river and continue your day. We all know that one of the first things that you do when you come to a stream fishing for trout, whether they be brown trout or brook trout, is to check and see what's living under the rocks, see what bugs might be here. I'm concerned about this river because it's super, super, super clear. There's no algae, there's very little grass, and when you flip over rocks, you get the odd caddis casing and that's it. So that tells me right away that they're gonna be eating protein. 
So I've tied on a bead head leech pattern um, and we're gonna swing through these little runs. This little creek is fantastic and we know from the locals that there are brook trout in here. All it is is a matter of finding out what piece of the puzzle fits exactly where. Beautiful fish. Job, buddy. So we've been hiking and hiking and hiking. We finally found this beautiful pool here. First cast, we had one come out, took a dart at it and missed it. So we went to the back and we found these beautiful brook trout. They're absolutely gorgeous fish. I guess you got to take a break from the bass fishing. You can go get brook trout, whatever. <laughs> do, you, do you remember that day, Adam? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we we, we must have walked 20 miles that day. <laughs> the member of the trail out. Have you ever seen Not so really. many trees down in your life? Oh, my oh. God. That was <laughs> unbelievable. We, and then yeah. and we, went, we went to the wrong road, didn't we? If we would have went to the left, I think the car was waiting for <laughs> No, you know what? You know what happened is we actually went to the proper spot, but we didn't walk up far enough to see his truck. Oh, he yeah. was there at the, at the first spot. Yeah. I remember it being something yeah. like that. It's half the adventure, though. Isn't there it? being some bugs too. I yeah. Remember, oh yeah, I think there was a couple uh, black flies yeah. and mosquitoes too. I remember I maybe I one Mark, or two. Mark's face might have uh, felt a couple bug bites that <laughs> day. Well, the key is uh, two things. One is. When the brook trout are active, the the bugs are active, right? It's just mm -hmm. they go together. Yep. Unfortunately, one hundred percent. Yeah, it's a and it's a duo. You can't have one without the other. Especially for brook trout, seems to be the yeah. norm. And then the mm -hmm. second thing is uh, what I like about this region is there's so many streams, but just as you guys have mentioned, you gotta you gotta bushwhack. You gotta go in and walk and walk and walk and. And I remember looking at pools and thinking, well, this is going to be really good and getting nothing. And then I go, I don't know, a hundred yards downstream and some innocuous looking piece of water. And I catch yeah. a bunch of 14 to, I got the biggest brook trout I've caught in those areas around 18 inches, in these small streams, but you're going to catch a lot of four. So with a four way rod catching, you know, 12, 14, 16 inch brook yeah. trout, that's a lot of fun. And if you're lucky, you get it when there's a hatch going on or, you know, as Mark was talking about throwing uh, leech patterns or throwing small white streamers. I've, I've had a lot of success, you know, throwing a cone headed uh, white uh, uh, woolly yeah. butter and just stripping them back fast and they'll come out and nail it. But if you like, I don't know, it kind of brings back my childhood memories of exploring creeks. It, it, it brings back your inner kid when you jump in those little creeks. Yeah, and I'm telling you, that, that, yeah. that creek was one of a hundred within an hour of that area. Oh yeah, yeah. that was just that was just one of. There was so like, there's actually so many of those creeks that aren't there. It, it's not like, active at all. Yeah, they wouldn't even have names. They're I just like our fish names. fishing up here and our bass fishing and well, I guess all of our lakes up here are pretty low pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but well, I think. Uh, Bushwhacking and brook trout fishing go hand in hand. I think I think uh, you can't have it both ways. If you want those fish, you got to get punished. Yeah, yeah we did. that was excessive coming back. That trail was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> They're the ones you remember. Oh, yeah. I'll never forget it. No doubt. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the last thing tonight. And I have to show yeah. this because it's going to give perspective to people about the size of bass that are in this area. And when we come back, I'll tell you, I'll put in my two cents about it. But first, let's watch this video because it's pretty special and it was a great way for you guys to end your time together fishing. Enjoy this.
Adam had me thrown into the back, slowly stripping, and then dropping it off the ledge. We saw the fish roll up in behind it. We slowed down the presentation and smash. Big old smolly. It's exactly what we're keying in on right now. We're, uh, we're chasing water temps as much as we're chasing uh, habitat for smallmouth to be. So first we find the temps and then we find the fish. Oh my gosh, it's a giant. That's a tank. That's an Algoma giant, buddy. That's there a hug. Go. That's a hug right there. <laughs> That's welcome to Algoma. Right oh here, my gosh. Welcome to Algoma. Oh my gosh. This is the reason we make the drives. Well, Mr. Metcalf, I have some good news for you. And what is that? What you may or may not know is that I am a IGFA uh, representative for, okay. can for Canada. So I have the power to legitimize potential world records and to make sure that everything is done. That fish weighed in on a scale that needs to be verified by the IGFA at six pounds, three ounces, right? Okay. You've got 12 pound tippet on. Yep. I'm very happy to tell you that you have an unofficial smallmouth bass world record right here in Algoma. Congratulations. Are you kidding me? I'm not kidding you. World record. Adam. I'm speechless. As you should look, you're shaking like crazy. I am shaking right now. Mike? <laughs> Probably the last thing I was expecting going up there. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Cool memory. I was, I was shaking. That's a but I'm going to tell you something. I didn't go through with that because there's a whole process that you have to go through with. You got to, I actually had on 3X earlier than that. The reason I didn't go through with that, I think there's an eight pound fish in that lake. I've caught one over eight in that lake. There you that's, go. That's where my biggest has come from. So I was going to go through all that. And then I thought, you know what? In three months, it's going to be six pounds and seven. And then in a year, it's going to be seven pounds. And someone's going to get one over eight pounds up there on the fly. Yeah. On I, the think, fly. I think I think you heard it here years. first. You heard it here first, eight pounds, two ounces within two years is coming out of that lake on the fly. You're going to catch it, Mikey? I, I hope. I just want to see it. <laughs> Go ahead. I Adam. hope I put them on it. <laughs> I said, I hope I put you them on it. Do you, guys, do you guys think I'm wrong? Do you think there's something nope. like that in there? No, no, no. I've got a seven. I've got a seven, a legitimate seven. And I will tell you. Mm -hmm. I, there you go. I was, we were talking about one of the flats. I was with somebody and I saw a fish that was all 24 inches. It was okay. easily nine pounds. Easily. Wow. It was the biggest bass I've wow. ever seen in my life. It was, it was like a, a yeah. big plank of wood. And my friend was at the bow of the boat and he cast and uh, fish took and he pulled and missed and fish spooked and that was it. And it was in maybe three feet of water. <sighs> Those big ones have a dumb moment, but uh, they're not big for no reason. You missed your opportunity. Yep. Yeah. Well, you they're know what? That fish made us uh, it made us friends for life. So, hundred percent. You got a friendship out of it. Yeah. And you became best friends that, after that fish. If people <laughs> should know about this that are watching is how many of these lakes are very clear. Um, like some are stained, but some of them are very clear, and you will see the fish. And oh and, yeah, and I'll well, point this. Point this to Adam. How many times have you seen a giant fish, the, whoever's, whether it's you fishing or it's one of your clients, and they've cast to that fish, and then a bigger fish comes out, but the small one, the, the big one, you, the one you thought was big, suddenly is dwarfed by the bigger one. And I've seen that multiple times coming there, spring. Commonly, mm -hmm. honestly. And it comes back to those wolf packs you were talking about. They kind of travel together, especially bigger fish. So it's a, it's funny. You think they're big, and then you see another one, and you're like, wow, that's what big is. <laughs> All right. It breaks your heart, too, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And especially if you think a three-pounder is already five pounds. You think in a six-pounder is ten and a half or 12 pounds. Oh, yeah. I've met a lot of 10 pound or people who've caught 10 pound small. Isn't <laughs> like that real? Like to, yeah. to, to think we're sitting here talking about 10 pound fish. 
small and fast. And like you, Mikey, when I was growing up in Georgian Bay at the cottage, if I got a four pound smallmouth, I thought I was a rock star. Yeah. And and up in Algoma, yeah. it's a nice fish. Yep. But you're no rock star. You're four. not even a gr you're not even a groupie. Four pounds <laughs> is a nice fish anywhere. But, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. listen, guys. That's really golf enjoyed, up there. I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, uh, talking about the fishing, talking about the season, some of the, about the flies. Um, I think the key is for anybody that watches this is they have to understand that the fishing there, it's really fantastic, but we have to protect it. And, yeah, uh, you know, I, one of the reasons you were talking about the pressure, but it's also the good news is by and large, most of the people who do bass fish there, they're total catch and release, right? They want this resource around. Oh, I mean, I, I, absolutely. Um, I don't have any problem with people harvesting. Uh, I just believe that people need to be educated on uh, what they're doing. Like we were talking about earlier, a five, six pound smallmouth is 25 plus years old. That yeah. equates to an 80, 90 year old person. Uh, think about it as you're eating your grandfather. So you're probably not eating a fish that's very good. So yeah. But what I'm saying is we need to uh, have selective harvest. And I think that's the best. That just comes with education and time. You're going to have your people who are going to harvest. You can't hate on them. But I, out of my boat, we're promoting catch and release. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. And that's a good way to put it, Adam, because uh, uh, I have no problems on the right lake and the right times and everything. If people want to keep a couple of the two, two and a halfs. Because no, the reality no. is, generally speaking, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, because I know this is true for pike and it's true for trout. Generally, when you get a big one, like I'm talking about a big one, those trophy-sized fish are generally females. There's, you know, don't get me wrong, there's some males in there, but they're generally females, and they're the future of that lake or river. Yeah. So that's why it's important to let them go. Same as walleye, right? I always, I always tell um, clients when I try and educate them or guests on my boat, I put it in a... Um, in terms of a pyramid, if you have any type of fish, no matter what the species is, you're only going to have a select number of fish that are at the top of the pyramid being your biggest fish in the lake. So if your biggest fish in the lake is an eight pound smallmouth, it's at the top of the lake. It is your alpha smallmouth, we'll say. As you go down that pyramid, you're going to have more six pounders, more, more five pounders, and the pyramid kind of makes its way out. And as you get into your two and three pound fish, you have an abundance of more two and three pound fish than you do six, five, yeah. six. It's the foundation of the, the foundation of the lake is the smaller exactly. size. It's not. You're right. not killing your lake if you're taking your twos and threes, and mm -hmm. you're still keeping your lake intact by allowing your spawners to reproduce. That's a good way of putting it, Adam. And it's well said. It uh, it seems to match with what the science yeah. is telling us from everyone that does. Uh, the work in this, this field and it doesn't matter if it's bass walleye or trout you know what i mean it, you know gents, we, uh, we had a blast up there with you adam uh you, <laughs> you're great at what you do and, and we had so much fun up there i'd fish with you anytime uh, it's very nice you to say mike yeah i feel the same way about you uh, adam even when you look like grizzly adams um but <laughs> <laughs> i'm, I'm kind of liking it actually uh, he looks like a uh, middle-aged adam i like it you know switch it up every once in a while he's just a young guy though it puts like 10 years on him. But anyways, it's like an old... He looks, he looks responsible now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so listen, gents, I yeah. think the key is, everyone, if you want to see the show that Mikey and Adam and Mark did, it's going to be on uh, this Saturday. Uh, it's on World Fishing Network. It's on Sportsman's Channel on Friday night. It's on Saturday night. Uh, if you check your... Um, uh, if you do have those channels, check and see when we're on. But uh, the key is, if you really want to see it, Watch on YouTube. It's uh, our biggest broadcaster now. We're still on public television and other uh, television mm -hmm. networks, but by far, our YouTube channel is huge. So this Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, this full-length show with all the good, the bad, and the ugly will be airing. And they're going to talk a lot about the fishing. They're going to talk about the food. They're going to talk about the lakes. And you'll learn about this part of Algoma and yeah. why we all love it. Uh, it's just so fabulous. and Get the popcorn ready. Yep. And Adam, 
thank you for taking us out so many times over the past few years. And what I feel yeah. so great about is that every time I send somebody to you, they always seem to hire you again and again because they just have so much fun with you, Adam. You, your knowledge, you make it fun and be in a boat with uh, all day, which is not easy to do. And uh, you help them get fish. So thanks, Adam, for all your help. Thank, I appreciate that, Colin. Thank you very much. Uh oh, Mikey's leaving. Your help. Yeah, no, all my right. battery died. I'm back. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyways, listen, uh, right. thanks, Jess, for. Uh, all right, gentlemen. Well, thank you so time. much. Great seeing you. Yeah. <laughs> You too, Mikey. All right. Thanks, guys. And uh, for everybody watching, uh, like I said, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this Saturday, you can see the show we did at Snowshoe Resort in Algoma and talking about the great bass fishing and brook trout fishing that can be had just off the Trans-Canada Highway. For, from everyone here at the New Flight Fisher, thanks for joining us. Have a good night.